Hi, my name is Michael Plesha and I'm a filmmaker. About one year ago, I finished a screenplay. It was a cyberpunk love story about two street kids hustling the red light districts of a big, grimy, futuristic port city. Hollywood said no. No. Nope. <laughs> they said that my story was like a French art film that I could go shoot for no money, except uh, that my story had a backdrop that would cost $80 million to make. The reason is that nearly every single shot of my world would need to be green screen composited for like tens of thousands of dollars per shot, which was impossible to justify. Like unless the city blew up at the end or the characters were wearing capes. Today we're at phase two space in Culver City, California on what used to be a green screen stage. What is it now? <laughs> I think as filmmakers, we're so used to being told no because our imaginations are often so much bigger than our means. I've wanted to make films since I was four years old and I remember hearing my first no when my parents told me we couldn't afford a video camera. But then feeling this elation when I learned that you could essentially make a film by just drawing it on post-it notes, frame by frame. So I was able with this really cheap way to take control of what I had wanted to do. I realized you could kind of find a way around no. Then when I finally got a video camera at 12 years old, I decided I was gonna make like a full-blown feature action movie. But then of course my parents told me that I couldn't hire real actors or buy explosives. What'd you do? That time I just got my nine-year-old brother and learned how to make explosives. <laughs> When we're not taking no for an answer, we should also be sane. The eyebrows grew back. Uh, behind me is the perch where my characters meet every night. And up here, they don't ask each other about the things they had to do down below to get by that night. Uh, they're really in love. It's them against the world and them trying to get out. Up here, they can dream and fall in love and be innocent. Yeah, the story, it meant a lot to me. It's the first one I had written a lot of myself into. My storytelling has softened. I did want to film my film for no money. I wanted to go through some portal with a small student film crew and just feed them future pizza and capture this with spontaneity and let the actors be inside of a space, hire actors from that world, it, you know, but it doesn't exist. I mean, it's, it's implied that because of financing models, I, I'd have to remove the setting from my love story because of all the green screen, but Everything my characters struggle with are symptoms of the world that I built, and the world that I built is my feelings about our own world. So it's not something that can just be removed. The city, you know, the city doesn't have handrails to stop you from falling and dying because it doesn't care about its people. And the floating cars rain down radiation on the inhabitants because the rich don't care about the poor. I myself have worked as a compositor and I calculated that it would take 
need 38 years to composite my own film. I was kind of depressed, and then one night, I look up, and I see one of the most famous visual effects sequences ever filmed, the tornado sequence in Wizard of Oz. I couldn't believe my eyes. That sequence was done without a green screen using an old technique called rear projection. And it, it dawned on me that Judy Garland was acting in front of a tornado that she could see with her own eyes. And it rivaled some of the best visual effects work that's done today. And I thought, well, that's something. Maybe we can learn from this. Maybe we could update this. So I came up with an idea to kill the green screen. But to replace the green screen, first I had to figure out what else I was gonna put there instead. The first idea was, why not just a photo backdrop? But the problem is they're flat, they don't move. My characters are dynamic, so for my film, the screen would have to adapt to a handheld camera's perspective. And I thought, what if we rendered all the angles? Bright enough, big enough, and fast enough that it would be seamless with the foreground. That's what I knew, I would need a team of people. Artists, entrepreneurs, technical wizards, cinematographers, scenes. So I called up my buddy Renee, who I thought might be just as crazy as me, and co-founded Arwa. Initially, as the team came together, we thought, simple, there's precedent for this, we'll just put the pieces together. But what we saw was, as soon as we started diving into this technology, this was a huge solve. Uh, and it hadn't been done yet. Everybody who had tried to do this was getting relegated into pre-visualization tools. When you're not using the actual CG for the final shot, you're just using it for the reference. Which was not suitable for the level of graphics that I needed. Hi, I'm Benjamin Chavigné. I'm a real-time photorealist. When the team first approached me, I thought it would be amazing to replace that with the screen. But I was also really afraid of the challenge. Creating real-time graphics is really complicated. Normally in a film, it could take days to render just a frame. We have to make something that would match movie quality, but it needs to run a million times faster. How can we do something this big, something this impressive? I also thought it was impossible because nobody else did it before. I was blown away as the graphics were coming together and the team was shaving off milliseconds. But the next challenge was finding a partner that would take the huge amount of latency off of the screens to make it imperceptible to the human eye or to the camera. And nobody would do it until we met Matrix. So I told the guys, you take care of your latency. Even if it means hammering at the whole global supply chain, we'll solve it on our end. Just be ready to test, because when those tiles land, it's not a lot of time to waste. After the screens came, I'll never forget the first night of testing. When everything came together, it was the best feeling in the world. We're creating a brand new production method. I don't think it's an easier tool, I think it's a better tool. But I think it just it forces you to think about what you're doing. It forces you to make decisions. Do you need the textures to match? You need the worlds to match. You know, not just a technology, but we're a system integrator. We're pulling from all these different worlds and pulling different people from all different worlds. We like this project because when you get material and a production technology that are purpose built for what these screens can deliver, the potential for savings and just sheer cinema magic is unparalleled. 
What I think is so unique about this new technology is uh, the new dynamics that it's creating on set between crew members who might not necessarily have any reason to interact otherwise. So uh, that's part of my job is bridging this gap between the people that are working with plaster and paint and the people that are working in ones and zeros. It's everybody working together to create the illusion, trying to get back to the core of what filmmaking was. My story is about two people who are fighting for some freedom and to hold on to some dignity in a city that strips it of them, but they're trapped. So they steal an old mop and take it to the highest catwalk and they liberate it by sending it flying, like a symbol of their own desire to be free. The irony was that the other night I was all alone on the set. I unscrewed the tracker that makes the world seem real to the camera and I just put it over my own eye and walked around. I guess I had thought, you know, my expression was trapped. I thought I'd never get to see my movie about a world about being trapped. And then there I was, not only seeing it, I was walking around it. Follow to join me, Michael Plesha, along with Arwal and our partner, Matrix Visuals, for future episodes exploring this new mode of production, and for behind the scenes as I direct my science fiction film without a single green screen shot. You didn't think that was a green screen behind me, did you? I was walking around in this city thanks to this team of people that helped free my expression of it. I got to be the mop flying free and I can't wait for other filmmakers to feel that with their own stories.